And it's another exciting show of the economy and you. I'm Chris Letham here on Think Tech Hawaii. Today's guest is Dan Walters. Dan Walters is the president or general manager, I'm sorry, for ClassicalLimos.com. Welcome to the show, Dan. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Nice um, to meet you. Yeah, so um, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about your business and the line of work that you're in. Uh, our show is called The Economy and You. Uh, sometimes it's a micro economy, economy of one, or economy of one small company trying to sort of sprout out of the sidewalk uh, here in Hawaii, because we know Hawaii is a tough place to launch a new, new enterprise. And um, so your company, uh, Classic Limos, ClassicLimos.com, has been experienced some of the weird and wonderful of uh, doing business as a startup here in Hawaii. Well, we're, uh, we're getting our feet wet right now as we speak. Uh, just got the limousine license from the PUC. Yeah, congratulations. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's a, that took a little while to get. It did. and Well, we had it before, and then uh, the insurance was the real challenge. And then mm -hmm. by the time the insurance came through, the first license lapsed. So now we, we've got the second license. So now you're ready to rock it. Now we're ready to go. Okay. Uh, a little bit off schedule, but everything else is still on track. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Good, good, good. So, um, how did you decide to get into the limo business that of would, all businesses? That would be my wife, Sherry, uh, the uh -huh. president of the company. It was her idea back, oh gosh, probably in 2002. Uh-huh. So it's her fault. Uh, yeah. 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 Okay. She, uh, she saw a company for sale doing what we do now uh -huh. uh, in uh, Orange County, California. And we went down and uh, met with the, the seller and um, got very interested in the entire business until uh, it came time to see the cars, and he didn't want us to see the cars. <laughs> and so we kept asking, when can we see the cars? And he had, <coughs> he had five Rolls Royces and a Cadillac, and mm -hmm. they were all uh, from the 30s all the way through the 60s. Well, when we finally saw the cars, then we understood why he was delaying. They were all fakes. They were fakes. They were uh, five fake Rolls and one fake Cadillac. How do you fake a Rolls Royce? I got to ask because this is just amazing. This yeah. astonishes me. You know, we had to have a joke called, uh, we had a, a, a car called a Rolls Hardly because uh -huh. it would roll downhill and hardly make it up the next. <laughs> but how do you fake a Rolls Royce? That's amazing. Uh, the most common practice in America has been to uh, bring a car in called the Austin Princess, mm -hmm. take the grill off it and put an aftermarket uh, inexpensive chromed rolls grill which is of course illegal now i have seen these on volkswagens by right, the way right but i've never seen anybody actually claim that it's a rolls royce well the, the story yeah. behind it is there was a, a a guy in the midwest in the 70s that brought hundreds of these over from uh, england but they were mm -hmm. where they were assembled but it's actually a denmark company uh-huh and then they're out of business and so forth but it uh they bought these cars they had british styling which then mm -hmm. lend lended themselves to uh, the fake rolls grill and looking like a rolls mm -hmm. and then he would put the fake rolls grill on it and then call up limo companies and say how would you like to buy a whole bunch of these for the cost of one rolls and that's how they kind of infiltrated america back in the 70s uh -huh. most of them today are worn out so you don't see that many southern cal probably has the most mm -hmm. and I would estimate there's probably still 30 running around Southern California yeah but, uh, but so anyway so you had these so the idea was you saw this and you decided well wait a minute this guy isn't selling real Rolls Royces so what did you do well he wanted a half a million for the business and we we thought well wait a minute how much do you want for the cars and he said 10,000 a car and mm -hmm. we said 10,000 for fake well that sounds like a pretty good deal yeah yeah so we decided you know uh, why don't we just put maybe our own money into starting something up and doing it the right way rather than uh, starting off with this whole history of fake roles and it was hard for us to uh, to accept the notion that there was goodwill there yeah because it's kind of like the guy that walks down the street and he pulls up his sleeve and he's got a bunch of rolex fake right. rolex watches running up his arm right right <laughs> it sort of gives you that same 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 sensation well there's two problems one is uh -huh. the fake part itself the other part is telling everybody else they're real yeah and that, that was what he was doing with the clients. Oh, he was telling them that they weren't. Oh, yeah. He had no indication anywhere on his advertising that these were fakes. Oh. And well, that, that was the real okay. problem. That's, that's like, misleading. Yeah. Yeah. So we, that's how we started. And uh, we, my wife actually found most of the first four cars, which uh, would be the, the stationary photo on our website. So is this like American Pickers? You go around and you find these, these cars that are sort of not being used and a little bit dilapidated and then... You have to restore them, or well, were they already in good working condition? It's a little bit of everything. Uh, 
Hemmings has a old car uh, ads and um, I think my wife found probably two thirds of them on eBay. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a certain look <coughs> that we're after and uh, she did uh, a lot of research initially, but we, we bought, uh, let's see, the 35 rolls from Canada. That was our first car. That did not arrive right away, so the second car we bought was our 27 Packard, which is now here in Oahu. Uh -huh. um, no, but a Packard is not a Rolls. A Packard is a very different kind of car, right? It's, it's a different kind of car. It's yeah. a, it's a high-end car like a Rolls, but mm -hmm. it's it's you know it's a it's back in the 20s. The nickname uh, for a Packard was the American Rolls Royce. Uh -huh. A lot of Americans would refer to a Packard as a American Rolls Royce. Um, but it's it's a high-end car. It's a so hand-built. Still a beautiful car, car yeah. They're bigger, typically, than a Rolls. Uh, yeah, with, and this is, what is this car here that we're looking at? That's the first car we bought, 35 Rolls. That's a 35 Rolls. That one belonged to Lady de Vries, uh, who owned the Mayflower Hotel in, uh, in London. Oh, okay. Now, when you see a car like that, I would imagine there's a great deal of work that goes into the restoration and ma maintenance of those vehicles. Yeah, the acquisition cost is high. Uh, uh, restoration is super high. Uh -huh. Repair is high. Maintenance is not so bad. Uh -huh. But all those first three, those are the big ones. Those are the ones that get, those are the gotchas, huh? And they... Well, they, these are beautiful cars. Yeah, that's a, that's a Rolls-Royce Silver Cloud one there. Uh-huh. And look at that, look at that. That's just, look at that. That's just a very memorable photo, something like that. Uh, now, the cars in the background there are yeah. the first four we bought. Uh, okay. Th there's a Rolls-Royce Phantom 5 by James Young, uh -huh. 1960. Now those two in the middle, um, those are the white and the and the silver. Those are um, uh, those are rolls or the two in the middle in the background. Yeah, the, the Packard's off to the right. That's the one that's here. Uh -huh. The one in the foreground here is the '62 Rolls Long Wheelbase Silver Cloud. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, that's our niece, by the now, way, in the photo. Oh, is that right? Yeah. She she looks great. And that's a '65 Rolls Royce uh, Long Wheelbase No Division, very very rare car. Uh huh. Wow, beautiful. And so now these cars, um, I'm, another do, you have, do you have to, like somebody in your family that has a special love of these vehicles that just comes in and takes care of them for you? Or? We have, uh, through the years, developed quite a few mechanics uh, mm -hmm. that do certain things that, uh, you know, that you get at some point, you, they become your go-to guy. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have to kind of develop your local talent. Yeah, we've we've through the years we've we've tried out different shops. We we mm -hmm. kind of have settled on uh, a really good machine shop that happens to also be mechanical, mm -hmm. and they tend to be very careful. Because sometimes they have to sort of create new parts because you can't buy them anymore. That's exactly right. Uh, the Packards, especially uh -huh. uh, the Twenty Seven Packard, there are no parts to buy anywhere uh -huh. that we know of. So if something breaks, uh, the machine shop will tell us if you see it cracking. Let us copy it before it breaks. <laughs> ah, 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 good, good, And then good, they, yeah. have, they have a template to go off of. Okay, so preventative maintenance is a big part of your, your requisite to yes. stay in business then. Yeah. The real key with the old cars is uh, making sure they don't overheat and making uh -huh. sure you have good braking. Those would be the two big keys. Yeah, okay, cool, cool. Now, um, you've gotten this. How many cars now do you have in your fleet? Uh, between California and Hawaii, we have 12. You have 12, okay. And then you have two here. We have two here, so 10 in California uh -huh. now. And at some point, you'd like to bring over a couple more? Like to end up with at least six here. Would you? Really? Yeah. Okay. So that means you've got to have, uh, you've got to have a demand. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. So what do you see now? One of the things when we talk about as clearly your value proposition is there. You know, we talk about the value proposition of a business, and, and that is that uh, you've got these beautiful cars. Um, I'm sure people enjoy riding in the cars. Um, that I'm sure the ride is fantastic. The interiors mm -hmm. are probably immaculate. Um, and so, um, how do you build a market for these vehicles? Well, that would be my wife's um, uh, in area. She, she does great marketing with the website. And uh -huh. In our case, we're mainly weddings, so she's going to market to all of the wedding, uh, the high-end wedding uh, online sites in mm -hmm. California. Hawaii is a different uh, setup, though. Hawaii is primarily going to be Asian weddings through wholesalers. Yes. So California is a retail market for us. Every bride calls us directly. Mm -hmm. Occasionally we'll get a parent calling us or a wedding planner, but most of the time it's the bride calling us directly, mm. and I take those calls. Well, you know, Hawaii is a little bit different market, especially the Asian market, and, and, uh, and I will sp specifically say the Japanese market because mm -hmm. the planners are in Japan. Right. So if you want a planner to book your vehicle, uh, 
you, you pretty much have to go to Japan. That's right. And talk to the planners there, uh, because the coordinators were only going to coordinate the weddings that had been planned uh, previously um, off-site uh, in Tokyo or mm -hmm. Osaka mm -hmm. or wherever they might be. So um, I think you should go to Japan with me. That's a good idea. I think you should come with me, and we'll go talk to these wedding we, we realize that's the place to actually get it done. Uh -huh. uh, well, the last time we were here on a research trip, before we moved, uh, one of the uh, landmark hotels here in uh, Waikiki, uh, the wedding uh, director there told us, he said, you know, you start doing the weddings for us, and within a couple of months, the wholesalers from Japan are going to be calling you and asking you to service their company rather than our hotel. He said, that's my biggest concern. <laughs> and he said, that once that happens, he said, you'll be back uh, bringing your whole fleet over. Uh -huh. So I don't know how true that is, but I hope it is true, because uh -huh. it's nice to have the fleet in one location and I, as, as opposed to two states. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Well, why did you choose Hawaii? When you were thinking about this business and moving vehicles to Hawaii, I mean, you kind of had a flavor that Hawaii is a tough place to do business. I mean, if you read Forbes magazine, we're number 50 on the list of friendly states to do business with. We're dead last. So do um, you just have masochistic tendencies, or <laughs> is it that you, did you just see something here that nobody else saw? Well, keep in mind, we're from California, which is also a highly regulated state, not mm -hmm. the easiest state to do business. Um, but you're 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 correct. Uh, <laughs> this is this is a little bit tougher. Uh -huh. But part of that is it's new for us. Mm -hmm. um, the thing to remember with uh, with our business is, and and this is where we felt that Hawaii wouldn't be an undue burden for us to to, to figure out. In California, the two regulatory bodies, which are basically the same as Hawaii, would be <coughs> the PUC mm -hmm. and the DMV. Mm -hmm. When you read the entire code that applies to, to what we do mm -hmm. from both agencies, it's really clear that neither agency thought of us for a millisecond when they wrote the code. <laughs> you know, vintage that, that, vintage that's right. limos mm -hmm. used for weddings yes. and special events is not something they had in their mind yeah. when they wrote the code. They're, they're thinking full-time limousines. They're thinking... Uh, an emphasis on transportation. Well, because normally what happens when you write statutes like this is that you go talk, you bring some people in who work in the industry, mm -hmm. and they probably went out to some of the bigger ones, invited them into a, a session, and said, we're going to write some regulatory laws around this to protect your interests. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that's how it got framed, yep. you know, because we want to make sure that, you know, you have... Um, reasonable protection under the law that you're prevented from undue litigation and yada 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 and then you're mm -hmm. operating within the confines of the law and these are probably the guys that were sitting in the room you weren't invited so yeah. how did this impact you well you know with the, the california experience was a little bit frustrating every year we would call the head of licensing we'd say okay we've got inconsistencies between your two departments here mm -hmm. which one shall we listen to on this point and he would sort that out for us and say, okay, I've made a record of it. You're good to go for this year. Thanks for bringing the inconsistencies to my attention. So uh -huh. we thought, you know, with, with that whole thing, uh, it probably prepared us a little bit for Hawaii. But Hawaii, keep in mind, has never really had this type of industry hit it before. No, no, well, we do have inconsistencies. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, I mean, the vintage wedding right, car market yes. is almost non-existent in the state of Hawaii, uh -huh. which is kind of a, gets back to your other question on why we wanted to come here. Uh -huh. it, it's, if you analyze the wedding market worldwide and you look at uh, the popularity of cities and locations around the globe for weddings, Vegas is number one, mm -hmm. not for dollars spent, but for volume of weddings. Right. Istanbul, Turkey is number two, which surprises a lot of people. But that's kind of like the, the Vegas of the Middle East. Oh. And then you get to number three is the state of Hawaii. Okay. The difference between those top three is Hawaii has a lot more time and money being spent here. On the weddings. On the weddings because they're destination weddings and the bride is coming with a small group or her family uh -huh. and usually staying seven to ten days and merging it into a honeymoon. Well, we're going to talk a little bit more about this because I think this is an interesting topic. When we talk, start talking about demographic, we got to take a short commercial break. Okay. We're going to be right back. I'm Chris Leatham with The Economy and You. Today's guest is Dan Walters, and we'll be right back. Stay tuned for more. Aloha. Hi, I'm Ethan Allen, host of Likeable Science on Think Tech Hawaii. 
I hope you'll join me every Friday at 2 p.m. to discover what is likable about science. We bring on scientists of all ilk, astronomers, physicists, chemists, biologists, ecologists, and they talk about their work, and more importantly, they talk about why you should talk about their work, why you should think about their work, why you should like their work. I help them bring out why their work is understandable, why it's meaningful, why people should care about it, why people should support science. We have a good time. We talk about current uh, events of interest. We talk about uh, historical events sometimes. We dig deep into their research, why they do, what the joys and delights and frustrations of their work are. And in all, we, we show a, a real world of science, a real world of likable science. I hope you'll join us every Friday at 2 p.m. And welcome back, everybody. I'm Chris Leatham here with The Economy and You here at Think Tech Hawaii. Today's guest is Dan Walters, the GM for ClassicLimos.com here in Hawaii. Um, we're just talking about some of the interesting demographic. You said Hawaii is number three. Turkey's number two. Istanbul, Turkey, you said. That's right. Number one is Vegas. Vegas. Yes, the, the, the land of the drive through wedding. Yes, right, you got to right. love it. Um, Istanbul, Turkey does sort of surprise me. I'm not surprised that Honolulu is in the top. Uh, uh, well, this is number three. I, uh -huh. think, I don't know about uh, Waikiki, Honolulu. I, I mm -hmm. think it's the entire state of Hawaii. As a, but most of the weddings are here. Yes. Uh, but it comes in number three. And getting back to your other question on why we actually wanted to come here, we were on vacation. We d did a couple of vacations here. And the first time we were at Koalina, mm -hmm. and we kept our, our sliding doors open the entire week, never did close them. And so we fell in love with the weather. Yeah. And we're over there looking at one of those coves and one of those chapels and watching eight weddings every day. And bear in mind, we're from you know uh, an right. area that that ninety percent of our business is a wedding on Saturday afternoon. You did you see me out there going, don't do it, don't don't don't, don't do it. <laughs> Don't do what? Don't get married. No, <laughs> <laughs> no. no. <laughs> we, we, had, yeah, we, we had never, ever seen anything like that. Yeah. And then we started to inquire, and then we realized how often that's being duplicated all over the island. That's right. With weddings at chapels, uh, just... just. A, well, do you understand why the Japanese come here to get married? Do you know that there's really a strong rationale for that? It's not just because they love Hawaii. I researched it, and hopefully my research is correct, uh -huh. uh, but I researched that it started with Princess Di's wedding. Well, it also has to do with if you get married in Japan and everybody shows up at your wedding, That's right. you have to go to everybody else's wedding. So if you come to Hawaii and get married and you only invite a few people, then you only have a few weddings to go to. That's the financial side, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and obviously, too, it's a time consideration. Because if you have the, the Japanese sort of keep a book of, you know, uh, everybody that we, you know, who came to the wedding, and so we have to make sure that we reciprocate. Mm -hmm. And this book of reciprocation, I, for lack of a better term, um, could go on for years. And so by coming to Hawaii, you sort of break that cycle of having to reciprocate. And then everybody's still being polite to everybody. Everybody's yeah. still being polite, but you don't have to go to, you know, three weddings a month for the next five years. I had heard that uh, when I actually went online and did research for where it uh, originated. It was mm -hmm. the um, Princess Di and Prince Charles, when they got married, was a live broadcast. Mm -hmm. I think that was before VCR, so people weren't recording it, but there was almost a billion people watching live. And that included Japan. Mm -hmm. And up till then, 95% of all the Japanese brides were getting married in Buddha temples. Yes. And uh, the same year, and I don't know the name of this actress, actress, but she was a singer actress, a beautiful woman that was, uh, I think, in her 20s or 30s, was the most famous person in Japan at the time. Mm. And after Di Prince Diana's wedding, she got married and decided to do Western style and mimic ah. what everyone had seen. This must and have been Seiko Matsudai. I, I'm just guessing, but I got a feeling it might have been Seiko Matsudai, a singer-actress who uh, was very popular right. back and in that she era. Never, and after she got married, then she, she retired from uh, singing Yes, well, that's acting. kind of the, yeah, that's the sort okay. of social norms and okay. sort of, that's the way it works. And what, what my research said is that's where it started with ah. the Japanese bride. From then on, the, I, I want to have a Western-style wedding became the thing. Uh-huh. And uh, so... Here we come. Here, here they come. Well, and that ties into what we do in California because yeah. if you if you look at uh, our market there in the mainland market, the average caller thinks it's about photos and transportation mm. in a vintage car. 
The average bride is inspired, gets on the phone, I start to converse with her, and she is, without telling me, envisioning the movie version ending. That ah, she, yes. That grand send-off, throwing rice, everybody yelling and screaming at the car. Uh -huh. And then the bride and groom are the first to live, <laughs> right? That doesn't happen on the mainland now. No. That happens in every wedding in Australia, in New Zealand, yeah, in, in most of the churches. We don't throw rice anymore? We don't do any of those things anymore in the mainland. We don't even end the wedding outside anymore. Really? And so, when, yeah, when a caller comes in, I have to correct their, their uh, presumptions there because I don't want them to be disappointed. So I oh. let them know how their wedding is slated to end. It's going to end in the church when the priest or minister introduces them as a new couple. That's where it ends. And people start clapping, and then they walk down the aisle, and uh, that becomes the ending of the service. Well, we've never ended our wedding there. We've always let people have the option of a grand send-off at the car. Yes. As far as I know, we're the only ones that do that nationwide. See, that's so awesome. That fits the yes. whole reason why the Japanese bride want to come here, which is to get the Western style. So I'm just going to start a new business of people who do nothing but stand outside expensive cars and throw rice. <laughs> <laughs> and bring a broom and a dustpan to clean it all up, but it's all over with. Yeah, cool. The, the best way to think about it is uh -huh. if you were to have a, um, a rich uncle provide a bride last minute with a horse and carriage at any church in Oahu. Mm -hmm. uh, there's over 700 churches in Oahu. If you had... Uh, a, a horse and carriage show up at a church, <coughs> everybody would instinctively know what that's there for. It's not really for photos. It's certainly not for transportation to the reception. It's a mm -hmm. horse and carriage. Mm -hmm. It's for the final scene of the wedding. Because it looks good. Yeah. It looks great. Yeah. It's, you know, it's, it's where everybody gets to yell uh -huh. and scream. Yes. Yeah. And it's that sort of that photo finish where you have that sort of grand finale and it's beautiful and you get to sort of ride off on it. But, you know, it's hard to tie, it's kind of hard to tie those cans behind a, a horse and buggy, though, right? You don't necessarily. Now, do, do, do they request the cans behind the we limo? We do get that request uh, probably uh, several times a month. Mm -hmm. And we'll, we'll go ahead and do that if it's all on private property. Yes. In California, you don't want to be caught going down the road with sparks. <laughs> You'll start a forest fire. <laughs> you'll, get, you'll get a ticket real quick. Yeah, hey, you're going to get in trouble. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, but we get that uh, request and we do it. And well, how about shoes? Is shoes are something that they... We've done shoes. shoes? I've, I've uh -huh. I had one uh, that was a, a movie uh, scene shoot on a mansion up in the mountains of, of Malibu, uh -huh. where when we did the grand send-off scene, when I'm looking what they tied behind my car, it was shoes, it was uh, about a half a dozen brand new stethoscopes, uh -huh. which I never quite understood what that was, but I ended up getting a couple of those. Uh -huh. they, they were all chipped up, but they worked fine. Yeah. And... Um, uh, yeah, that's interesting. The yeah. stethoscope thing. I never I'm quite sure figured yeah, out what that was. Get that, what that's all about, yeah. Well, here's the thing. So now you're doing business in Hawaii. And what are you sort of emotionally, what, what, where are you at now? Are you, are you excited? Are you sort of now a little bit sort of having now dealt with Hawaii, going, wow, this is a tough place to do business? Well, it's, it, uh, the, the, the tough part with Hawaii was really the insurance. Uh -huh. there's, there's less companies offering insurance. Um, in our niche, on the mainland, there's less companies offering insurance for what we do than there mm -hmm. is for regular limousine service, right. and that's just magnified Now, is here. that a barrier to entry into the... In, this sounds like a barrier to entry. I think it's probably the reason why uh, the number one or one of the top wedding locations in the world doesn't have a vintage wedding car industry. Uh -huh. I think it's the insurance. It's the insurance. We have insurance now. It's, uh, I, I hope to find some that's more affordable because it's a lot more than what we're paying in California. Uh -huh. And uh, we've never had an accident, never had a claim. And mm -hmm. we've been the largest in America for 12 years. So that's interesting. Actuarially, I wouldn't think that California and Hawaii would be significantly different in terms of the experiential aspect of, of doing an actuarial assessment, yep. which is how you would determine the premium. You're absolutely correct. Mm -hmm. If you look at... Uh, most of the commercial uh, limousine vehicles here that you see in abundance from mm -hmm. motor coaches to, to limousines and you get a, a, a quote on what that would be for Waikiki yeah and then you compare the same vehicle for the same coverage in uh, say Southern California where we're from mm -hmm. uh, you're gonna it's yours. I want all those insurance companies out there listening out because this is this is 
This is where you go, well, where does the rubber meet the road here? And how is it that you can justify charging so much more in Hawaii than, say, someplace like California? When and California is not known for, for uh, right. low, low premiums. And if you did a comparison, which I've done, you'll find California's a tad more yeah. across, the line, across the board. And then we hit the vintage side, and we were getting quotes when we first got here of 10 to 20 times what we were paying in California. 10 to 20 times. I, just, I would see 10 to 20 percent. Maybe even 25%, but 10 to 20 times, it doesn't seem to make, actuarially, it doesn't make sense. And I think, yeah, it's, yeah. I think it's a little bit of uh, just a few companies that do it, uh -huh. and then no volume, and no, no, no history, uh -huh. fear of the unknown. Okay. Um, I had one agent tell me we're on an island, and I said, well, so is New Zealand. Uh -huh, that's right. <laughs> and New Zealand... And they have earthquakes. And they have earthquakes, yeah. and they're right on the ring of fire. Uh-huh. And New Zealand has one company with more vintage wedding cars for hire than any company in America. Well, I want to talk about I want to talk about one thing before we get it. We just have a few more minutes left of the show, but I want to talk about that young couple that's in the car. And we were talking earlier about that sort of that mistake that new grooms make uh, when they are on their wedding day. Because I thought this was kind of funny. Um, so the the wife is. Uh, the new wife or the, is uh, in the car as something goes awry. The flowers didn't show up with the right color or... Yeah, anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and so here's yeah. what... So explain to us what this mistake is, just, to, just so that all those guys out there know how to address this problem. Yeah, uh, sooner or later this will happen to just about every groom through, throughout the wedding day, at least mm -hmm. once or twice. The bride is going to have omnivision. She's going to notice every mistake of the day. Because it's, it's her day. It's her it's day. It's not his. It's hers. That's exactly right. Right. And so the groom won't catch things, but the bride will see everything. Uh -huh. Behind her, to the side, doesn't matter. As soon as she sees a mistake, she will typically verbalize her uh -huh. displeasure. The moment she does that, the groom will typically ask her to repeat uh, whatever is bothering her. Yeah. And so the example I gave you earlier was Charlie forgot the flowers. Yeah. And the groom will say, what was that, honey? And uh -huh. then she'll say, Charlie forgot the flowers. And then he'll pause and he'll say something really stupid. And listen, guys, this is, this is it. This, this is, is it right here. Really stupid, like, oh, honey, don't worry. It's no big deal. Yeah, the no big deal. It's a downplay. No, 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 don't do that. What you do is take her side. Yeah, up play it. Up play it, right? How could he do that, right? Yeah. Like, like that, right? Well, we're almost out of time. So how can people get a hold of you? Uh, what's the best way people can reach out and talk to you? Well, you can Google us, Classic Limos Hawaii, Classic Limos Newport Beach, 800-550-3125. Uh, One more time? 800-550-3125. Uh, put the website on the screen, classiclimos.com, yeah. Yeah, and then our cars will have little signs on them uh, that'll say 888-LX-LIMOS. Uh, uh-huh. That'll work, too. That'll work, too? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, Dan, it's great to have you on the show. Good luck with your business. Thank you. I wish you all the success in the world. We'll see you in Japan. Okay. Okay. Let's I'm go. Chris Leatham. This is The Economy and You. And we'll see you next time somewhere in maybe Indonesia. Aloha.